Step out of the way, break into the wild, and don't be afraid. into the spaces, graces, waiting for you. Dance like the way that's been lifted, graces. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of his love. For the spirit is here, and there be freedom, and there be freedom. Graces waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Graces waiting. Where the 
you are, that you are free indeed. If you're listening to these words as you're singing them, you're going to see what his word for you is today. He says you don't have to be caught up in all of the things that are going on if you just lean on him. Our Father, Creator, you hold our hearts together. There's one higher than Our great and mighty Savior, there's no one higher than you. You are always with us, gracious to forgive us. By your power we've been set free. And Lord, we stand amazed in your presence.
for who you are, for your grace, for your peace. sufficient for you. You are free in me. You are who I say you are. He wants you to lean in a little bit more. Just enter into worship in a deeper way. Connect with your Abba Father. Oh, Daddy, we praise you this morning. We worship with the heavenlies this morning, God. We sing a new song this morning to you. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the past of sin and shame. Heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. Listen to this. You you have no equal 
you, Father. Thank you. You may be seated. Yes, Father. Thank you. Good morning. We're so glad that you're here today. And since I'm up here, I'm just going to do announcements from right here. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to remind you, inside of your bulletins, you have your next step sheets. Please be sure to take the time to fill those out. Such an important way for your pastor and staff to stay connected with you and to know how we can be praying and supporting you. And if you're online or driving with us, please be sure to head over to the website to the virtual connection card. We have a couple of events coming up. Well... Okay, we can remember that while we're walking and moving about the building, uh, that we need to be wearing our masks while you're seated. Of course, you're welcome to take them off. When you're singing, we do ask that you keep them on. We're doing our best to stay safe and keep everyone protected to the best of our abilities. We have a couple of events coming up on October 17th. That is this Saturday from 9.30 to 11.30 a.m. is a youth event. We're gonna be carving pumpkins, rolling up our sleeves, getting our hands a little bit dirty, and just having a great time together. So please be be sure if you have any youth in your family or that you know of, please uh, be sure to let us know, let Todd know that they're coming and we're going to have a great time. The other big announcement is Trunk or Treat on October 31st. We are going to do a drive through edition. So we need you. Not only do we need candy donations, if you are at the store, please be sure just to grab a bag, toss it into the basket out in the lobby. But we need cars. In order to make this a fun event for the community coming in, we need cars to be decorated. If you're not sure what that means or what to do, please come see Todd or myself. We would be more than happy to share with you or go on Pinterest. It's a phenomenal place to find ideas. Um, but we would love to have 20 cars. I think we're now at about six, so we're well on our way. Um, we need a minimum of 12, otherwise it kind of falls flat. So we need 12, so we're halfway there. Um, but we'd love to have 20. If you can just come out, decorate your car uh, as we invite the community in and just be a touching base with them and a place that they can come and know that there are people who care about them, right? And that's what we are here to do, to, to make that first step for them. The children are dismissed to the back of the sanctuary to head downstairs, and we'll send everything else over to you, Pastor Eric. Yesterday was Aaron's birthday. Can we give her a great big hand? Thank you. No. Uh, it's so good to see each and every one of you. Um, did that make it work better? Okay, there we go. Is that better? Um, I uh, want to say a big thank you for all of you that have already given to the Timothy Initiative. We are working right here, and I'm going to talk more about that in a second, but we're also working overseas. We're working everywhere, and for $300, you can plant a church in a village that has never, ever in 2,000 years had a church. And you can do that. You may never go there. You may never see it. Or maybe you'll join me on one of those trips to go there. But I'd like to invite you to grab this card that's inside your bulletin and say, I'll give a church. This is my Christmas gift for the Lord. Uh, so I'll give a church um, uh, $300 to do that. Or you say, whoa, 300 is way too much for my budget. 150 There are a lot of folks that are giving $100. $75, there's a quarter of a church, and uh, we'd love to see 20 churches planted over in countries that have never had it. Now, like I said, we're working here as well. On uh, Wednesday nights, we have discipleship so that we can learn how to share right here in our own backyard. And this week, just this week, I got a note from someone saying, Thank you for helping us learn how to spread the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ. And that's an excellent description. We are teaching you how to share the love of God. You want your friends, you want your neighbors, you want your coworkers, you want the other people in the groceries to know Christ. We're going to show you how to do it in a wonderful way, so you're not stumbling over your words. And so I'd like to invite you to come out 7.15 to 8.15 as you watch how we do it and we begin those first steps. And I just want to encourage you to come so that you too can be sharing the good news of Jesus. Uh, speaking of sharing the good news, in uh, like almost two weeks, um, 
We're going to have an outreach for those struggling with substance abuse. They just, as you saw in the news, did a huge arrest of people that were selling uh, heroin laced with fentanyl, which is leading to overdoses. More uh, people died in Rensselaer County of overdoses than of the COVID virus. This is so important, and it's going to be a rap person, which I know many people go, ugh, rap music, but it's a way of reaching out to these people, and that's what we care about. And uh, we're trying to keep as many seats. We're not just inviting people, but please pray. If you'd like to come, I'd like you to come and pray with people. So talk to me if you'd like to come. Uh, but mostly we're hoping that Bobby Stacks reaches a group of people that we don't know that come in here and that we can have a chance to pray. We're going to have a baptismal setup. He thinks he already knows of two people that want to be baptized. But we're hoping people will get saved that night and baptized that night. So that's what we're doing. I love, thank you people online and watching. You've been writing encouraging comments about this. So many people have come up to me and said, you have no idea how this hits so close to home. You have no idea. And I didn't have any idea, but it's all around the area. Some people say, well, it's just in the big, every rural community everywhere has this problem. So please pray for that. Speaking of baptism, November 22nd, we're going to have a baptism here. If you're interested, a slip that you got in your bulletin, the next step sheet, and let us know about that. And I think that should do it. Um, I'd like to ask you open your bulletin and look at the outline. And uh, whoops. How come it's on the last point? Just a second here. Rita, can you push it all the way up to the first slide? The very first slide. I'm not clicking all the way through all of it. We've been looking the last couple of weeks at how do we deal with an age of rage? How do we deal... That, that's the, f the last slide. That's 12. Um, how do we deal with an age of rage? How do we do deal when we have cities with fire uh, burning, um, where there's destruction and hatred uh, going on? And we looked at how we need to show kindness, like the Good Samaritan did to someone in need. We talked about how we need to stop, look, and listen, and ask questions, and pray for people like Jesus did with the blind men that were crying out to him. We talked about how we need to give our presence. We need to listen. Listen is a love language. Listen is validating. We talked about how important it is. And then we talked uh, last week about how important it is to share, that we need to share and speak, and we need to speak about racism and how we're opposed to that. We need to speak about, um, look at some of those things. Oh, impartial justice, how we are in favor of not a two-tier justice system, but a one-tier justice system where there is no impartiality. We believe in forgiveness, that there can be healing for these things that have been going on for a long, long time. And the church of Jesus Christ is big on healing. If you don't forgive others, Christ will not forgive you. I mean, that's how strong it is in the Bible. And so we talked about that and the dignity of work and the power of the family to solve these problems, the breakdown that is going on in the family that is leaving destruction and how important that is. So this week, we want to go a step further about the need to plant seeds, the need to speak out. We've talked, again, four weeks, five weeks about listening and how important that is. But there comes a time to speak. There's a season for everything. We begin with listening. We're quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. So let's look at the... Uh, oops. Let me back up here. Okay. I'm having computer problems at home. It's not enough that the electricity is out. Then in addition to that, I'm having computer problems. So please bear with us. 
Let's look at these scriptures that are very important in Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. This is God's inerrant, infallible, and all-sufficient word. Don't be misled. Did you know that you can be misled? Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death. If that's where you're planting, it's just whatever's good for me, that's what I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus on me, myself, and I, and that's it. Then you're going to get decay and death from the sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit, we're trusting the Holy Spirit to guide us, will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. If we give up, there's no harvest. I'm so excited. We have in our discipleship ministry, we've got 52 different people that are at different levels of discipleship. Some are barely tolerating me speaking about it. And others are running with it with everything they've got. 52 different people I'm checking in with weekly in this area of discipleship. And I'm so excited. We've got to not give up, though. Therefore, whenever the opportunity, we have the opportunity. In other words, there are going to be times when you don't have the opportunity. But there are other times where it's time to speak and where you do have the opportunity. We teach people in discipleship, look for a green light, that means go. We've got two people so ready to accept Jesus, I'm hoping this week they do. Uh, that's a green light. They, whatever you say, if you say your ABCs, they go, oh, that was wonderful. Um, they're just so open and receptive. Then there are people that, at the yellow light, it's cautionary, uh, be careful, you can go, but proceed with caution. And then there are red lights, or Ooh, don't even go there. Um, and... Uh, We've all run into that brick wall at some point. So, therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone. Not just one race, not just one socioeconomic group. To everyone, especially those in the family of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Um, this week, and Governor Como said, I don't care what your religion is. You've got to follow the rules of the state. There's something called the First Amendment where the church, there is freedom of the church. And what he was talking about is a, an outbreak of the COVID virus in Brooklyn in uh, an acidic Jewish uh, pop, uh, neighborhood. But... When the state starts controlling the church and everything else, we've got a problem. And we need to step up and speak truth. And if we don't stand for our liberties, we will lose them. On the front page of the, uh, of the Times Union this week, there was the very first article at the very top of the page, Bishop Church says bishop is wrong, and it's about Bishop Love of the Episcopal Diocese of the Albany area, and he stood up for marriage between a man and a woman and said what we've believed for 5,000 years of recorded history, we still believe in, and we believe that's the way God said it, and that's the way it is in the Bible, and he's going to be disciplined. He said he's guilty, they say he's guilty, and the... Uh, Episcopal USA Church is going to be disciplining him. That's the age we are living in where something you didn't even hear about 20 years ago, didn't even know existed, you are now to fully endorse because the state says so. This is a difficult time that we're walking in right now. 
If you're working for any federal agencies or in the military, you're hearing about critical race theory, which says racism has been a part of the United States forever. There's no way of fixing it. We are inherently racist. And so we need to destroy all the institutions. We need to defund the police. We need to break down the family. And we need to begin all over. We need to have a cancel culture where we get rid of all statues and all history of the past because the history creates racism. And so we have to remove it all. That's when it's time for us to speak up and to say something. I have a good friend that is in the western part of the state, and he um, went to church a Sunday morning early in the uh, summer, and there were three different churches having holding it outdoors because of the virus and meeting together, and there's a responsive reading where you're supposed to repeat back, and he called me up, and then he sent me the actual bulletin. And as a part of the responsive reading, you were to repeat back, I admit that I am a white supremacist. Now he's going, I don't even know a white supremacist. I have never thought of being, hey, it would be cool to be a white supremacist. That would be pretty. And studies show it's a tiny, tiny fragment of the population. But you were to repeat that. Well, wait for the second line. You like that line? Wait. The second line, the first line is, I admit I'm a white supremacist. The second line, if I refuse to admit it, then that is proof I am a white supremacist. So if they didn't get you on the first line, they got you on the second line. And again, this is being taught in federal agencies. This is being taught in the military. And President Trump just made an executive order this past week to stop it because he'd already asked them to stop it. And uh, they continued on. And uh, so now he made it an executive order. There's a book, Required Reading, in many, many corporations called White Fragility, which means whites are fragile, fragility. They're fragile because they're so uncomfortable when you tell them they're a white supremacist and they have trouble responding back. And so there's white fragility that we need to get over and be willing to be told that we are racist from the beginning. The answer to critical race theory is critical thinking, challenging, thinking through what does it look like defunding the police? What does it look like when you separate from the... Uh, nuclear family and no longer have that? What does it look like when there's no longer private small businesses, but instead there are, uh, the government is over everything? And what is so important is that we plant seeds of truth and speak at the right time after we've listened, after we've understood and sought first to understand then to be understood, after we've shown kindness and demonstrated that, then there comes a time to speak up. And so if you have your outline, I'd like you to notice number one, everything starts as a seed. God said, Genesis 1:11, let the land have seed-bearing plants and trees that bear fruit with seed in it according to their varieties. Everything began with a seed. Every dream you've ever had began with this little seed in your brain that later developed. Every dream that you've ever had began as a little thought. Living Hope Church began as a dream, began as a thought, and then grew and developed. Our nation began as a thought. What if there could be a place where you could pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? What if there could be a place where we recognize that people are made in the image of God and everyone gets one vote and I can try and persuade you and you can try and persuade me, but when push comes to shove, everybody gets one vote because we're all made in the image of God and so we are allowed to speak even though we're told we're um, impossibly racist and we couldn't possibly 
uh, have anything to say. In fact, in some of the federal agencies, they're having two groups. They're segregating the groups. And if you're Caucasian, you're in one group. If you're not, you're in another group, and you get different training. And that's what President Trump stopped this past week. Everything begins as a seed, and that's where it all starts. Secondly, if you look on your outline, a seed is anything valuable. I'm going to be asking you to give away that seed and watch as God multiplies it back to you. Number two, nothing happens until the seed is planted. John 12, 24, Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, it cannot reproduce. But if it dies, it will produce much fruit, not a little bit of fruit. Nothing happens until we plant the seed. Uh, nothing happens until we give away what we have. Imagine a farmer going to the store and getting a great big bag of seeds, but just leaving it there and wondering why his fields aren't full of corn or wheat or beans or whatever. Nothing happens until the seed. I have the seed. I need to give away that seed and plant it. And it's risky because I can't watch it and I don't know what's happening in the ground. It's in there, but I can't check on it every day to see what's happening. It's in there and that's what happens when I plant a seed. It's a step of faith and it's risky because maybe it's going to die in there. But I need to do that. I need to lay down and plant that seed. Jesus said he compares the kingdom of God to planting a seed in Mark 4, 26. The kingdom of God is like someone who plants seed in the ground. Night and day, whether the person is asleep or awake, the seed is still growing. But the person does not know how it grows. All he knows is it's in there. Is it going to come up fast? Is it going to come up slow? Is it getting enough water? Is it getting enough fertilizer? We don't know. We're trying our best, but it's a step of faith. When I have a need, number three, I plant a seed. It is so important when you have a need in any area of your life, you say, I don't have enough skills like I'd like to have. Then invest the skills you do have and give them away and watch as God develops more. I don't have enough time. Give time. I don't have enough energy. Go to the gym and work out and give energy and watch as God gives it back to you because you planted and gave it. Whatever gift God has given you, plant that seed. And watch as God returns it to you. Listen to what Ecclesiastes 11.6 says. Do your planting in the morning and in the evening too. You never know whether it will all grow well or whether one planting will do better than the other. Every time you plant a seed, it's not going to grow. And so you need to have lots of seeds and doing lots of planting in lots of different areas. And you're planting in the morning and you're planting in the evening. You're planting in the afternoon. You're planting on this day. You're planting on that day. And there needs to be lots of planting. And again, whatever area you have a need, then you plant the seed. Imagine this farmer has this barren field and he's praying, Lord, please have this field turn into a fruitful field. And God says, well, I want you to go plant. He goes, no, I don't want to do that. Lord, but please make this field grow. God says, you've got to get out and plant. We need to plant. You are made in the image of God. We sang this morning, you know who, I know who you say I am. And we're going to go by how, who God says we are. And we're going to believe what God says about us. And so we don't just pray. We also plant seeds. And we wait for God to take those seeds and make them come alive. And sometimes you say, I'm waiting on God. Other times, God is waiting on us to plant some seeds. And then he can do his part. But he's not going to do it until we do our part. God's waiting on us sometimes, to plant those seeds. Whatever I plant, number four, is what I will reap. 
Galatians 6, 7, you will reap exactly what you plant. If I plant corn seeds, I'm not going to get beans. If I plant zucchinis, I'm not going to get squash. What you plant is what you get. If you plant a bunch of criticism all the time, you're going to reap criticism. If you plant kindness, you're going to reap kindness. Now, I've got a caveat for that in a second. But whatever we plant, that is what we reap. Uh, the person who plants selfishness, this is Galatians 6, 7, uh, ignoring the needs of others and ignoring God harvests the crop of weeds, useless weeds. If I'm planting and ignoring others and ignoring God, that's all he'll have to show for his life. That's all he'll have to show for his life. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's spirit do the growth work in him, harvests the crop of of real life, that abundant life, eternal life. It matters what you're planting. In your family, what are you planting? Are you planting love and consideration and compassion and caring and truth? Or are you planting bitterness and anger and judgmentalness and harshness and then shocked that it comes back? Whatever you plant... That's what you're going to get. You think you're getting, you're not getting away from it. It's coming right back to get you. Listen to this scripture. Oh, number five, I'm not the only sower. People say, hold it, I did planting and I got back terrible stuff from me. How come? Because you're not the only one planting. There was a battle going on in this world before you were ever born. There were things going on that you had nothing to do with, and you're paying the consequences of it. If, and as in my family, terrible alcoholism two and three generations back, we paid a consequence for that. But yet we had other things that I benefited from because of wonderful characteristics that my family members had. And I was the recipient of that, and I didn't do anything. I got the blessing, but others had been doing the sowing. John 4, 38, Jesus said, I said, you didn't plant. Others had already done the work before you, and you will gather the harvest. It's so wonderful when somebody comes in, and they are so ripe because somebody else had worked so hard sharing the gospel, speaking truth, paying the price, and then for whatever reason they moved with a job or what, I run into them, and it couldn't be easier. It's not because I worked so hard. Somebody else was planting, and I got the benefits. And it's the same, the opposite. You do something, you said one little word, and somebody blew up. That wasn't because you sowed a bad seed. Somebody else is sowing. Satan is sowing in this world. The world is sowing. Hollywood is sowing. The media is sowing. Hollywood, let's see, academia is sowing. I talked yesterday to a college professor, and he uh, walked into a, a room, uh, a meeting room, with a bunch of other professors at his college, and he said, what would you think of the uh, inauguration, or the um, State of the Union address last night? He said, I didn't actually see it, but somebody said it was really good. He said, you should see the color in their face. Just go out. Sheer white, what? You dare to mention a Republican in this room, other people are sowing and people are responding. And that's why it's so important that we sow as well. It is vitally important. Other people are doing the sowing. Six, I always reap in a different season than I sow. When I sow a seed, you don't get an immediate harvest with that. It's down the road that you get that, that it happens. Here's what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.1. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. There is a time to plant. So there's planting season in the spring. There is a time to harvest. It's harvest time in the fall right now. There's a time to scatter seeds. There's a time to gather in the harvest. But it's a different season, and so there's a time of waiting in faith 
trusting that those seeds are growing, even though you can't see them and you can't dig them up every five minutes and check them out. It's a step of faith that you offer these seeds and you watch what God does. And one flourishes far more than you ever expected. One little word. We've got somebody in this room that accepted Christ because of one word that somebody said. And they responded. It took them seven years to, before the seed germinated, but they responded. And then others won't grow. And you fertilized it, and you've watered it, and it doesn't. And the Bible talks about that. That there will be seeds that don't. You've done everything you know how to do. But they come, takes a season, and it takes a period of time before it happens. Seven, I must be patient and not give up because it's taking so long. Again, here's Galatians 6, 9, our main text. Let us not get tired of doing what's good. Why would we get tired? Because it takes a while. We're waiting. And, you know, a grapefruit takes two years. If you plant a grapefruit, it's two years before you get a grapefruit. That's a long time to wait. But that time is coming when you'll be able to harvest. Let us not get tired of doing what's right, for after a while we will reap a harvest. You don't know where. You say one little word over here, zoom. Another word you give over here a lot, nothing to show for it. We'll have a harvest of blessing if we don't get discouraged and give up. Obviously, people are getting discouraged, and that's why Jesus or Paul said that. Um, number eight on your outline, I will always reap more than I plant. Some seed fell on good soil, Mark 4, 8. It came up and grew and produced a crop multiplying 30 and 60, 100 times. So here comes one little apple seed, and up comes a tree. And who knows how many hundreds and hundreds of apples come from one little seed. One little seed can just take off and be so powerful. Number nine on your outline, I increase my harvest by planting more seeds. You say, I've not seen much of a harvest. Then plant more seeds. Invest over here. Have you thought about investing here? Invest over here. You've heard the phrase, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. That's what this is saying. Invest in lots of different areas. And seeing, well, this one didn't come up as fast as I thought, but this one's going great. And so you want to invest and plant more seeds. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. If you're just putting out one little seed here, don't be shocked that not too much is happening. Plant lots and lots of seeds and watch what happens. Many of you remember Jay Faubert, and he always talks about being willing to do anything in his business, his contractor business, willing to do anything. And they were going through a really dry time. And I wonder, how in the world are we going to pay the bills? Well, he got a job to paint. He didn't want to paint. He can do, he can fix anything. He's incredible. He didn't want to do that job. He said, I'd better do it. And he invested his seed, so to speak, in painting. Well, that painting led to this job. Oh, did you know that's broken? That toilet isn't working. That sink's broken over there. That deck's about ready to fall off, et cetera. That led into like $40,000, one paint job, because it led to this and this. Then the neighbors noticed the work, and they said their deck's falling off, and their plumbing isn't working right, and their electrical is off. And so all these jobs, I think it was $100,000, that he in, uh, received investing one little seed of doing a paint job that he didn't want to do. We need to plant seeds. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Pretty soon there comes a place where it's just one seed after another is coming and coming and coming. Each one should... Give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you don't want to give it, God says, don't give it. Don't give it. But he's saying, don't sow sparingly. Sow generously and watch what happens. Proverbs eleven twenty four says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. This is the message paraphrase. 
The world of the generous gets larger and larger. They keep giving and they keep receiving back and it's growing and growing. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller as they're reaping less and less and hanging on to it so tightly and it gets smaller and smaller. The more seed I plant, the more God will give me. So I'm planting more and more seeds and God keeps bringing me more seeds to plant. I didn't have those plant seeds before, but now I keep giving to the Lord, and he keeps giving me more. For God, who supplies seeds? He's the one that gives to us. So God, who supplies seed to the farmer and bread to eat, will give you more and more seed to plant. So as you are reaping, because you've been planting and sowing seeds everywhere, there comes back more and more to you. And he will make it grow so that you can give away more and more fruit. God wants you to be able to give away, but it begins with planting seeds, which is always a risk. That seed costs money. And now I'm giving it. I'm planting it in the ground. I can't watch it. I can't watch over it. And it's growing. And we're seeing things happen. And more and more fruit comes from the harvest. God is looking to support people of faith. God is looking. This is one of my favorite verses, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. In the King James, it says, uh, go to and fro throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is looking for people who give him 10%. Is that right? God is looking for people who give a good 50%. That's pretty good, right? 50-50 is good. It's better than 10. God is looking for people who are fully, fully, let that sink in, committed to him. And he's going to strengthen you as you pour out for the Lord. He's going to strengthen you, and you'll go through trials that just would make you nuts if you knew that they were coming. He wants people who are fully committed. He's looking. Who's fully committed to me? I'm going to strengthen them. I'm going to get to them, and I'm going to help them. And that's what God does. Number 11, I plant by faith, not by feeling. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, and they sing as they return with the harvest. You may not know this, but you know how sweet and nice I am. Amen? Hallelujah? Okay, not too big an amen. Uh, but anyway, I don't always feel like being nice to somebody. Sometimes I feel a little cranky. Maybe I'm the only one. Don't say yes. Maybe you feel a little grumpy some days. But you say, no, that's not the seeds I want to plant in my family, in my marriage. That's not the seeds I want to put out. And so you stop, and you don't go by your feelings. You go by what God says to do. And as you go by what God says to do, the Holy Spirit takes over and makes us want to be caring and loving and thoughtful and listening and not talking about my interest all the time, but about God's interest. Many of you have planted in buckets of tears over people that you love so much, and they won't respond to the gospel. If you stood on your head in the corner for an hour, they still wouldn't come to Jesus. And so you plant in tears, trusting. And you can't see it happening. Where's that seed? It sure looks like it's doing nothing. In fact, it got worse after I shared. It didn't get better. They plant in tears, but they're going to harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant the seeds, but then they're singing when they see it happen. So please be aware of that. That's so important. When's the best time to begin? Later. 
some time later. I'll pray about it, and later is the best time to go, because later I'll have a lot more time. Right now I'm so busy. I'll have a lot more energy. Later I'm going to have so much money, you wouldn't believe I'll have plenty of money later, just a couple paychecks away. The best time to plant is now, right now. Don't wait. Ecclesiastes 11.4, those who wait for perfect weather can never plant seeds. It's never perfect weather. It's never the right amount of energy, never the right amount of time, never the right amount of money. You always need a little bit more. Those who wait for perfect weather will never plant seeds. Those who look at every cloud, oh no, here comes a cloud. I can't plant now. There's a cloud up there. They will never reap a harvest. In Proverbs, it talks about the person who says, there's a lion in the street. I can't go. There's a lion in the street. We're scared, and we haven't even looked in the street yet. It is so important that you begin now. Begin planting. You've done the listening. You've done the caring. You've been thoughtful. Now it's time to sow a seed of truth to speak up at work, to speak up with your friends, to speak up with your neighbors, to speak words of truth, of course, in a considerate way, not in a condescending manner, but speaking and sharing God's truth. What I want is for you to see with your own eyes the power of God. And for that to happen, you need to plant a lot of seeds in a lot of different areas, in a lot of different ways. You need to be planting seeds. And all over the world, we're watching as the gospel is taking those seeds that you are helping these churches to get there, and the seeds are exploding. Watch this video as it talks about that. I've heard with my ears. My fathers have told me about the great things God has done in ages past. I've heard about the mighty movements of the Holy Spirit. I've heard of masses coming to Christ. And though I rejoice to hear it with my ears, my heart's desire was to be able to see it with my own eyes. Like the blind man in the Gospels, my prayer was, Lord, please open my eyes. I want to see. Well... God has answered that prayer and done so in an incredible way. With my own eyes, I've seen churches planted by the tens of thousands, reproducing like rabbits, springing up everywhere, in houses, caves, dried up riverbeds, under trees, in alleys, and on rooftops. With my own eyes, I've watched them, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, animists, gathered together, seated in little fellowships on the floor, worshiping the one who redeemed them praising Him with their lips, with tears in their eyes and joy on their faces with their hands held up in praise. I've seen them clutching their Bibles, holding them tight, even kissing them. I've watched as they prayed prayers that shook my soul. I've seen them set free, delivered from disease and demonic forces. I've seen people touched, changed, healed by the mighty name of Jesus. I've seen them bringing their families, their friends to Christ. I've seen them like a mighty army going from village to village, place to place, mountaintop to valley, preaching his name, leaving new churches behind. I've no longer just heard about it. I've seen it. I've seen first-generation believers who've given up everything to know him. I've seen persecuted brothers and sisters rejoicing to be counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. I've seen wizards idol worshipers, those in bondage to every conceivable vice set free. I've seen former Muslims not only worshiping Jesus, but making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. I've seen trafficked sex slaves now bringing other girls to Christ. I've seen orphans, widows, the least of the least being loved, fed, and cared for. And I can only say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I not only get to see it, but praise your name. I get to be a small part of what you're doing. Hallelujah. Praise your holy, holy name. Amen. Yes, that's the praise Jesus. The Timothy Initiative has come from nothing 15 years ago to the second largest church planting movement in the world. 
and we have a chance to plant seeds there, even though the vast majority of our time we're planting seeds right here, we have a chance to do that. And I want us to uh, see right here and around the world, to see with our own eyes fruit, seeds sprouting and springing up and bearing fruit everywhere we go. Would you grab your next step sheet and on the back of it, there are just three questions. Lord, I want to give my best to you. I want to give my very best. It's costly to give that seed. But God wants us to do it, and he will give the growth. Number two, Lord, show me how to joyfully and eagerly plant for you. Show me where there are green lights. Show me where there are yellow lights. Show me where there are red lights. And you share wherever you get that opportunity. And finally, this is how you begin a relationship with God. I repent of my sins and ask Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. Put this and your uh, Timothy Initiative card, church planning card, and a generous offering back in the buckets that are there by the door.
Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, thank you for continuing to show up and to speak to us. God, as we leave here, we want to continue to remember that it's in you that we live and move and have our being. And we just ask for your word that came forth this morning, that you would just bury it deep in our hearts, that it wouldn't fall on the stony rocks, but it would be planted deep inside of us. So as we go out, we can plant the things that you want us to plant, the things of you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.